Professor Heppel, you have had a very illustrious, and if I may say, exciting career, and that is why we'd like to interview you for the Eminent Scholars Archive. The way that I've approached the previous interviews is to look at the scholars' achievements in a chronological order. Your life, probably more than anyone else's I suspect, is a career in two parts. Consequently, I thought we could start the first interview dealing with your early life, which we might say is up to the time you left South Africa at the age of 29, and then in subsequent interviews deal with your new career in the United Kingdom and the various scholarly works on labour law for which you were knighted in 2004. You were born in 1934 into a country with a turbulent political history. It would seem to me that the trajectory of your later career may well have been strongly influenced by your grandparents and your parents' political views. So I wonder if we could start with your memories of your grandparents and how they may have influenced your life, even by proxy. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to take part in the interview. Uh, yes, I was very much influenced by my grandparents and my parents. Uh, my uh, grandparents were immigrants to South Africa and they were on different sides during the Boer War. Uh, my paternal grandfather, Tom Heppel, um, had qualified as a skilled pattern maker in Sunderland uh, and uh, there was no work at the time at the end of the 19th century. So he emigrated to South Africa and worked for a company called Stuarts and Lloyds. And it was just before the Boer War when the so-called Eightlanders, the foreign people in the Transvaal Republic, um, were um, trying to get the vote in the Transvaal and they organized, uh, they were being organized as a little army and my grandfather every Saturday afternoon had to march up and down behind closed doors in this British company. Uh, this was uh, preparatory to the Jameson Raid which had been organized into the Transvaal under Cecil Rhodes' uh, his, uh, instigation, and, uh, but it failed and the, the, all these people were arrested. I'm not quite sure how my grandfather got out, but he left the country and in fact he spent the war, uh, year, years of the Boer War in uh, England. And my father was born soon after he came back. Uh, my grandfather had married uh, Agnes Borland, uh, whose own father uh, had been a soldier in the British Army, first in India and then in the province of Natal, in South Africa, the colony of Natal. And uh, uh, he had been given a small piece of land at a place called Viennan. Um, uh, but because of Zulu raids, they m immigrated into the town of Peter Maritzburg. And uh, she used to, she's the only grandparent I remember because the others died when I was quite young. Uh, and she used to tell her stories about uh, the famous uh, battle of Islantlwana when the Zulus defeated the British army. When in Peter Maritzburg they had to form a lager to protect the town and they were expecting a Zulu attack, which in fact never happened. But um, So that was a living kind of link for me with the history of colonization in South Africa. Um, but when the, after they came back, my paternal grandfather uh, was one of the founders of the South African Labour Party, which was formed by uh, English-speaking artisans in South Africa. And uh, his wife, Agnes, uh, in fact was a suffragette, uh, who was locked up a few times, I believe, for demonstrating uh, to get the vote for women in South Africa. Uh, on my maternal side, um, they were of Dutch origin, and my uh, maternal grandfather, Alexander Swarenstein, uh, was in fact a, a Dutch Jew. He wasn't a practicing Jew, but a, a secular uh, Jew, and he really came to South Africa, I believe, for an adventure at a young age, uh, in order to fight for the Boers. And uh, he um, was what's called a reportrayer. Uh, he had to carry messages from uh, the poor headquarters in Pretoria to Mafeking, which was then under siege uh, uh, by the Boers, and uh, which is about a 200 mile journey on horseback. And I've seen a photograph of him, unfortunately now lost, of him as a young man on horseback, as carrying these messages uh, across. 
But he, um, just before the war had started, he had started a little butcher's shop in Johannesburg. When he got back, he found a British uh, soldier guarding it. And um, uh, because they sort of uh, confiscated all Boer property. And, uh, but he did a deal with this man. He said, if you let me into my shop, I'll make you a partner. And this man, um, this uh, uh, British soldier, agreed. And so the rest of his life, he was uh, a partner in the in this butcher's business, which my grandfather had started. So those were two kind of links with the past of South Africa and the conflicts that I had. So your primary school days, which I guess were from about 1939, yes. um, would have lasted for the duration of the war. Yes. Um, do you have any recollections of this yes. period? Well, I mean, South Africa was a long way from the war front. All one knew was of uh, some um, friends and family who were in the South African army that went to fight in North Africa and Italy and of people being killed. As school children, all I can remember is we had to have air raid practice, but there was, of course, never any air attack on South Africa. And I remember seeing Italian prisoners of war who were brought... Uh, uh, to in the areas near us, and many of them settled there subsequently. Um, but uh, the war years as such were not very significant for me, except um, my father was in the kind of dad's army, which is um, was something called the Civilian Protection Services. They took over the, some of the functions like driving ambulances uh, where, where other people had gone off to the war. And my father was at the time working in this wholesale meat business and he was up at five every morning and then he would come home in the evening in order to do this work at night and um, on one occasion uh, he was uh, beaten up by an organization members of an organization called the Osaba Brandfach which was a, 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 a an Afrikaner organization which supported the Nazis uh, among its members was John Foster, who later became Prime Minister of South Africa. And uh, uh, th this group, of course, did anything to sabotage the war effort. And uh, one of them was to beat up these um, dad's army people, including my father. I remember visiting him in, in hospital um, after this incident. So that kind of showed me the dividing lines in South Africa and made me think of many of the members of the, the subsequent nationalist government in the light of being having been Nazi supporters. Very interesting. Mm. Um, this was in Johannesburg? Yes. Yes. So, um, your years at secondary school, yes. which roughly I think would be from about the end of the war to yes. about 1952, yes. would have been quite formative years for you. Do you have, have any recollections of your secondary school? Well, of course, you've got to remember that um, at the time in South Africa, all schools were racially segregated, and we were also segregated by be uh, gender. And I went to Jeppe Boys High School in Johannesburg, which um, was modelled on really an English grammar school. Everything was like we had to do an 11 plus examination to get in. And uh, fortunately, I was always quite good academically in the other top of the class. Um, but uh, my memories, uh, they were not entirely happy ones because, um, because my father was active in, uh, as a Labour politician uh, and um, he was not kind of in favour with most of the white parents and they passed on to their children. So I was always being harassed and ridiculed because of my father's political affiliations. Uh, so... Um, None of the teachers, any one I can remember, made a, a big impact on me. And he was a man who'd fought in North Africa during the war. And he was a wonderful history teacher and really inspired my interest uh, in history. Um, but most of the rest of the teachers, I have to say, were bigots and racists. Yes. And, um, you know, so I never felt really comfortable at school, although I had quite a lot of friends. Um, I was never much, uh, never felt one of them, if you know what I mean. Yes. I, I wondered about that. Um, were, were, was rationing, were they still rationing? And I don't remember rationing. Yeah. We, were, we, were, we always seemed to have enough to eat. <laughs> <laughs> the National Party came to power in 1948 yes. when, you were about, when you were 14. Yes. Do you recall what, if anything, this altered? Well, I do, very much. Uh, 
I remember the day uh, they were elected, uh, and my mother wept, and I couldn't um, understand, you know, I said, what's wrong, because my father had then just stood as a Labour candidate in the elections, and he'd won with a very handsome majority. At the time, the Labour Party was in alliance with John Smith's um, United Party, and he stood on a coalition ticket, and he had five opponents, and he beat them by a very large majority. So I said, why, you know, why are you unhappy? And she said, this is going to be a disaster for South Africa. She had foreseen that, and she was right. Yes. Um, and so it did make a big difference, because after 1948, first of all, South Africa became virtually a police state by stages, and secondly, you know, the apartheid laws were introduced. There'd always been white supremacy and a lot of um, de facto segregation, but now it became the, the policy of the law. So, um, yes, I think it made an enormous difference to my life yes. uh, and, and to the lives of many people. Yes. And that according to the 2004 book, The Future of Labour Law, Amicorum Bob Hipple QC, which is a tribute to you by Dr. Catherine Barnard et al. You were arrested when you were 18 and you were put yeah. on trial. What were the circumstances? Well, um, of this? The, the background was that uh, I had just become a student at Fitz University in 1952, and it was at the time of the uh, defiance campaign organized by the African National Congress. Uh, where they broke the r racial segregation laws, going to white post offices and uh, white railway carriages and so on. And uh, soon after I came into the university, um, we, I went to a meeting which was addressed by two students who had taken part in the defiance campaign, uh, later became very famous um, black doctors, Mutlana and G. And while they were talking, the police broke in to the meeting and arrested them. And of course there was an uproar and we immediately had a demonstration and went into, I followed them into the centre of Johannesburg to the police station to protest. And that kind of marked my transition. I just thought it was so outrageous that these two students had been arrested in this way. And uh, I also was sympathetic to the aims of the ANC. Uh, and so I then became involved with a, an organisation called the Student Liberal Association. I became chairman of it. And um, we used to go out into the black townships. Because of the racial segregation, white people were not supposed to go into black townships. And we organized a concert, uh, which was really a cover for a sort of political meeting. Um, and while we were there, we were arrested. Now, they could have just fined us 10 pounds, uh, but instead they decided to charge us under something called the Illegal Squatting Act, which says that, you, you know, we were being treated as squatters, although we were only there for the night uh, for, for a concert. Um, and there was a, quite a prolonged trial. And I was already a student at Wits University, and I can remember one day every week virtually I had to go to, these, to, to the trial, and I was called as a witness um, in the trial, but we were all acquitted uh, because it was a, a ridiculous charge. So that, that was my first experience of arrest spending a night in the cells because we were arrested in the Orlando Township. At the beginning of your time at Wits? Yeah, early in my time at yes, Wits, yeah. about 1952. It was either 52 or 53, I can't remember it, exactly. It must have been quite traumatic. Well, it was uh, a kind of initiation in a way, because you, it just made one angry and all the more determined to, to play a role of some kind. Yes. So I then became involved with um, there was uh, a white offshoot of the ANC because it, even the African National Congress was racially segregated because of the effect of the laws and so on. It was difficult to have any kind of multiracial political organisation. So I joined and uh, something called the South African Congress of Democrats, which was the white offshoot, and became chairman of its youth section uh, at that time. So, you know, this arrest really... Uh, and all the other circumstances it just led me further down this line. You chose to do law at Wits. What made you decide to do this? Yeah. Well, I'd always uh, had my eye on one of two careers. The one um, was the law. I had a, uh, a cousin who was an advocate at the Johannesburg Bar, and I was very interested in advocacy. And in fact, at school, I participated in things like the debating society 
and I was keen on amateur dramatics and so on. So th this was one route. The other was I was always interested in writing, and I was interested in becoming a playwright or a journalist. Mm. But everybody I spoke to said, no, no, you must get a qualification as a lawyer, and then you can decide. Well, once, of course, I got into law, I was trapped, and I remained <laughs> a lawyer for the rest of my life. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, it, uh, in those days, you had to do a non-law degree before you could do law. Law was a postgraduate degree in South Africa. So I did a general degree, a BA, a majoring in economics, English, and Afrikaans. And uh, then I then did the three-year law degree, but I did it, um, if you like, part-time, because... I served articles of clerkship uh, to become an attorney uh, and then at four o'clock every afternoon one would go to bits for two hours of lectures and then um, after a bite of supper you'd spend the evening in the library till eleven o'clock and so my life was Gosh. very full uh, and I, I really took to law, I enjoyed it um, but it was, as I say, it was done as a part-time degree over three years. Oh so were there any uh, teachers or lecturers who influenced you in yeah. this time? Well, in the in the um, Witts uh, Law Faculty, there were two great uh, men. One was uh, Bobby Harlow, and the other one was Ellison Kahn. Now, Harlow had left uh, Nazi Germany in about 1934. He was Jewish. In fact, when he came to South Africa, he converted to Anglicanism. But... Um, he was a brilliant teacher, um, so clear, rather dogmatic, but really inspired one, and um, I admired him greatly as a teacher. However, he was a very um, domineering personality and also very dogmatic. He um, uh, kind of ran that faculty with an iron fist, and I later became a lecturer in law, and I experienced that myself. Uh -huh. But he was a man of considerable scholarship and international recognition, and he ended his days, in fact, running an international comparative law centre at McGill University. Uh, Ellison Kahn was probably the greatest legal scholar South Africa has produced. A much more liberal man, but very quiet, very scholarly. And he gave me a wonderful training, again, first of all as a student, he lectured on, co on contract and constitutional law and the conflict of laws. And all of those three subjects, I, I still kept to this day what I've learned from him. And particularly in constitutional law, he adopted an interesting technique of taking Dicey's rule of law and examining how far South Africa at that time compared to Dicey's vision of the rule of law. And on every count, of course, South Africa failed. Yes, um, and uh, it was his kind of way very gently of, of showing up the South African constitution of the time. And in contract law as well, he was a very meticulous scholar, and I learned really all my contract from him. And in conflict of laws as well, he was, he really, he got really interest. Not a brilliant lecturer, but nevertheless a great scholar. So I had those two, and there was a third person I should mention, that was Morris Milner, who taught me the law of tort, uh, or delict as it's called in South Africa. And again, a, he was a quite different type of lecturer. He always related everything to legal history, to society, uh, and, and, and gripped one's imagination. He later emigrated to England, and he wrote, became professor at University College London, and he wrote uh, what I think is still an outstanding book called Negligence in Modern Law. Mm. Um, so he was another formative influence on me. And in your early years, in 1960, you published a piece in this book edited by Harlow and Ellison Kahn. Yeah. And we'll come to that. Hopefully there'll be time to come to okay. that. It's a very interesting piece. Um, so you were president of the Witt Students Representative Council. Uh, did this affect your position with the university and the faculty authorities? Uh, well, that was as a result of my... Uh, activities on the kind of liberal left uh, and um, I was put up as a candidate for the Student Representative Council I eventually became president and they were very turbulent times. Um, they did, the, uh, at the time the government, the nationalist government had announced it was going to introduce racial segregation to exclude black students. 
Wits University and Cape Town were the only two open universities which admitted students of any race. And that, of course, was contrary to all the apartheid policies. And the government had decided on ethnic universities. Uh, they, they, they thought that um, the two open universities were breeding grounds for dissidents and opponents of the regime. And, of course, as students, we were very concerned we opposed it. But uh, at the same time, we felt that the administrators of the university were collaborating with the government and not resisting them properly and in particular they introduced um, racial segregation within the university so the great hall which had always been open for concerts and other events for all races they segregated and I was involved in protests against this which resulted in me because the then principal uh, very conservative man called Sutton had banned demonstrations uh, and I was then brought before a disciplinary tribunal, but he, he let me off. Um, they, uh, I wasn't uh, expelled or anything like that um, as a result, but uh, there was a very bad atmosphere. Now that, um, Harlow, um, who was not in, uh, by no means a person who was liberal or left, nevertheless respected what we were doing. Uh, the only kind of feelings I got in my position in the university were I was studying Afrikaans, and there were two very famous South African authors called C. M. Von den Heerfer and Abel Kutsia, who were the professors, both strong nationalists, and another one called P Professor Pinar, Professor Phonetics, and they really um, gave me a rather rough time. But I passed, I got through the exam, but they would make me very uncomfortable, uh, even in, examina in oral examinations and so on, to throw me off my bed. I always felt yes. there was a lot of yes. undercurrent there. Gosh, must have been quite disconcerting. It was, yes. 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 You represented NUSAS at a conference in Moscow in 1954. Do you have any memories of this event? Well, uh, the background there was that I was on the executive committee of the National Union of South African Students, and um, they, the union had decided to have a neutral line. They were, it was the middle of the Cold War, and... Uh, there were two rival student organ international student organizations, one called the International Union of Students, which was kind of communist-led, based in Central and Eastern Europe, but a lot of co people from the developing countries. And then there was the another one, based, I think, in Brussels, called COSEC. Uh, I can't remember what that stands for now, but they were uh, a rival. And NUSAS decided to have a neutral line to join both as affiliates, so we could keep in touch and kind of bridge the gap between East and West. And I was sent over to negotiate this agreement uh, at, at a conference of the International Union of Students being held in Moscow. And of course it was, uh, I had to keep very secret from the South African government, which at that time didn't have any diplomatic relations with uh, the Soviet Union, that I was going there. But and I went, it, it was just an amazing uh, visit getting there meeting all these students from all over the world, and so on. And I got my first um, baptism of fire as a chairman because I was asked to chair one of the sessions of the conference. And immediately there was an outbreak of almost violence between Israeli and Palestinian students who were there, and I had to try and control this. And secondly, I was rather duped because at the time the, there was uh, the symbol of the uh, communist-led peace movement was the dove of Picasso and at some point in the proceedings a Vietnamese student uh, came up to present to me to accept for the, uh, the uh, you know for the organization one of these peace doves this Vietnamese had the, the Viet Minh had just defeated the French at Dien Binh Phu and so he was a great hero of the anti-colonial movement and I of course accepted this but it uh, then made me prone to accusations when I got back to South Africa that I had been really duped by this communist peace movement. Uh, so it didn't um, it didn't rub off too well. And after a while, uh, the South African National Union of Students just disaffiliated from the IUS because they thought we were being used by right. the by the IUS. Now during this time, 1956. 
Nelson Mandela was arrested under charges that ultimately led to the treason trial in 1961 that he describes in his book. Your father, Alex, helped establish the treason trial defence fund. Yeah. Did you personally know Nelson Mandela by this time? Well, I had, as I said, become a member of the South African Congress of Democrats, and in that capacity I uh, attended ANC meetings and so on. And I... I met him just casually. I didn't really get to know him until later, until after 1961. Uh, but I did, of course, meet other ANC leaders and got to know them, like Walter Sisulu, who was later put on trial with Mandela. Um, so, yes, I was familiar with them. And, of course, as a result of my father's activities, so several of these people used to come to our home for meetings and so on. So I, I got to know quite a lot of the ANC uh, leaders. And also, I have to say, leaders on the other side, because my father was respected also even by the nationalists. So when he was in Parliament I used to go there and uh, on one occasion I even played for the South African parliamentary cricket team against the bar, uh, <laughs> led by a, a nationalist cabinet minister. So there was a kind of, uh, um, you know, camaraderie among MPs yes. uh, outside the debating chamber. So I got to know people on both sides of the, the spectrum then. This brings us to the time when you were a lecturer in law at Wits from 1959 to 62. Yeah. Uh, what subjects did you teach, Professor Heppel? Uh, well, I, I had qualified as a, an attorney, and then I decided after about a year of that I'd rather get back to academic teaching. And Harlow invited me to a lectureship which was vacant uh, without any advertisement or anything. I just said, come, I've got this vacancy. I went. But I think he was a little nervous, uh, knowing my political background, and so uh, I and he was, as I say, quite a strong personality. And you did what you were told, um, unlike the lecturers today who can say, "Oh, I'd like to teach this or that." You just did what you were given, and I was given um, the law, South African law, property, negotiable instruments. I think I even taught some insolvency, some contract. And so on, in all of which I was very interested. Um, and it was at that time that they also asked me to contribute to their volume that you mentioned, edited on the Union of South Africa. And I checked, I contributed a chapter on economic and racial legislation. But that was a written work. The teaching was in the field of property, negotiable instruments, uh, and so on. Sharp fall occurred in 1960. Did this impact on you personally? I mean, it must have crystallised opinions and polarised people's yeah. attitudes quite dramatically. Yes, I think it did. Um, I don't remember it having an impact on my position in uh, the university, but it impacted hugely on my, if you like, personal and political life, because um, everybody saw that something like this was coming, and I had been helping uh, the only multiracial trade union federation in South Africa at the time, the South African Congress of Trade Unions, and um, expecting that they would all be arrested, or many of their leaders would be arrested, they resolved that in the event of that happening, I was given all the administrative authority to um, run the affairs, administer the affairs of the organisation. Uh, and when the emergency came, that came into effect, and I then was devoting quite a bit of time to it. Uh, they were, most of them were eventually released, some of them fled the country, um, but it was partly as a result of that I decided uh, to leave uh, Wits at the end of 1961, and I went to practice at the bar, which gave me more freedom to carry on these other I activities. I, I mean, there was also, I, I, I thought... Uh, at the time, for university lecturers were very badly paid, and I just got married and was having children, and I decided I should try and make a more lucrative career at the bar. So you were a member at this time then of the South African Congress of Trade Unions, and you effectively ran it after the shark full of Yeah, for a while, and then the others then came you. back, yes. Well, this brings us up to the time when, as you said, you resigned from BITS to take up your legal work full-time. And this included your involvement with Nelson Mandela's incitement to strike trial yeah. and then the Ravonia trial. In the incitement trial of 1962, 
Nelson Mandela had his initial hearing on Monday the 15th of August 1962 after it had been moved from Johannesburg to Pretoria and because Joe Slovo was banned from travelling to Pretoria he couldn't help him hmm. and that is where you came in Professor Heppel. Yes. Uh, he relied upon you for legal yes. advice. Do, do you recount the circumstances of this meeting? Yes. Um, well, what happened was that uh, when Slovo was prevented from going on to assist him, um, I was asked by Mandela uh, to come and assist him. Now, Mandela had decided that he had no legal defence to the charges. There were two charges. The one was that he had incited a strike against the proclamation of a white apartheid republic. Uh, there was a kind of stay at home and at that time he was in hiding because the police were looking for him. He was known as the Black Pimpernel and uh, in fact I, in that period I had uh, got to know him quite well because I was one of those who was helping to hide him in various places and to take him to various meetings, some of which were held in my own house. So we had formed a bond then and I, I hadn't really known him, but I, he, he was a very charismatic, uh, interesting person. And so it was no surprise when he asked me to come and assist him. Uh, and so he was conducting his own defence. I, I mentioned the first charge was inside him. The second one was he left the country without a passport, which was a criminal offence. And there he had no defence. So he decided to conduct a political defence, but he wanted me with him to advise him on legal points and um, if I may I'll just say a few words about some features of Mandela's personality which became clear to me then. The first was um, that uh, he had at the beginning of the trial asked the magistrate to recuse himself, it was a senior regional magistrate, uh, on the grounds that Mandela as a black person had no vote and therefore had no say in the directly or indirectly, in the appointment of the judiciary. And why should he be tried by a white court in his own country? That was the kind of just... And of course the magistrate refused. And Mandela made a point of this by dressing up in tribal dress, a leopard skin and so on, just to make his point. Uh, but so, and of course in the trial, uh, one of the international observers, who happened to be Sir Louis Blom Cooper, noticed the white magistrate going out for lunch with the prosecuting detectives. So I went to Mandela and I said, look, you've got proper grounds for recusal now because he shouldn't be associating with the prosecution during the trial. And Mandela thought, he, he said, OK, I'll ask him to recuse himself. But he said, would you mind just telling him I'm going to do it? I don't want to hurt his feelings. So I was deputed to go and tell the magistrate, who went red in the face and blustered some kind of excuse for this. And, of course, Mandela uh, did ask for his recusal and was turned down. Uh, but um, the fact that he was so concerned about the feelings of this magistrate who eventually sent, sent him to prison for five years. Um, secondly, during the trial, the prosecutor, who had known Mandela as an attorney in Johannesburg, came when I was in the court cell talking to Mandela and said, please, can I talk to Mandela alone? I said, you know you can't do that. That's not proper. And Mandela said, okay, if he wants to, right. So I went outside for about 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, the prosecutor came out, tears streaming down his face. And I went in and I said to Mandela, what, what's going on here? Uh, what happened? And he said, well, you won't believe this, but he asked for, for my forgiveness. And I said, uh... I hope you told him where to get off. And he said, no, no, I told him I knew he was just doing his job. And he said, then he kissed me. Just and uh, if you read Mandela's autobiography, he tells the story from his side of the, of the door, and I can yes, confirm it. But it was, it was just remarkable, um, you know, things that we heard about that he did in prison later on, winning the confidence of the warders and so on. I think this is just uh, illustrated that he was always like that. Yeah. Although at the time, of course, he was regarded as a terrorist by the white population. Um, uh, there he had these qualities. So he was sentenced to five years hmm. and he ended up on Robben Island. But only five months later, he was brought back for what he calls in his book, the most significant political trial in the history of yeah. South Africa. 
and you were arrested in the original police raid at Lily's Leaf yes. Farm on July the 11th in 1963. Do you have any recollections of the events? Yeah, I have very vivid recollections. <laughs> um, what had happened was that after Mandela was sentenced, um, I was asked to carry on helping uh, some of these underground black leaders who were based at the Lily's Leaf Farm in Ravonia, their sort of secret headquarters. And um, I did so. And uh, I went out there you know, several times, quite regularly, and I was that kind of uh, lifeline for them because they re relied on me to bring them messages, uh, translate them back to other people, and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, on the 11th of July, 1963, I was there for a meeting. And soon after arriving, the police raided, and um, uh, we were all arrested. And I was then uh, kept in prison in solitary confinement and interrogated for three months um, about this. So uh, I certainly have very vivid memories of that, that event. Your experience is something that most of us can hardly begin to conceive of, um, yeah. being in solitary confinement yes. like that. Um, it, it must have been very, very hard. Uh, at the time. Yeah, and, and it was. It was, uh, and it was something for which I had not prepared myself adequately. And in retrospect, you feel I should have done this, I should have done that. But uh, the uh, I was never physically tortured. As some of the African, many of the African prisoners were, but the psychological pressure uh, was great. And they used to do things such as play Russian roulette with one. They just have a pistol on the table and say, "Now we'll spin this around. Do you want the bullet or do you want the noose?" And, you know, the, this built up over intensive interrogation, which was done over days um, when one was just not allowed to sit, kept standing, couldn't go to the toilet and so on, and kept under intensive interrogation for yes. several days on end without sleep. And so it, it, it certainly eventually wears you down. Do you have memories of these momentous years when you were in touch with other very famous people like um, perhaps Mbeki or Joe Slovo or any Yeah, I mean those people like Govan Mbeki, the father of the current um, president of South Africa, uh, he was one of those who was arrested at Ramon, you know, yes. so I met him in that capacity. Similarly, uh, Joe Slovo and also Brom Fisher uh, were two lawyers at the Johannesburg Bar and they were in fact the people who asked me to um, do help these underground leaders. They were much more closely involved than I was, and um, so that's how I, I got to know both of them. And um, Brom Fisher was a particularly uh, great man, I think. Um, whatever you might have thought of his political views, he was uh, for an Afrikaner who could have become Chief Justice or even Prime Minister of South Africa. He came from this very distinguished uh, Afrikaner family from the Free Orange Free State. Um, and a very able man who'd been to Oxford and so on. Um, he sacrificed everything and was totally dedicated, you know, yes. to to this uh, movement. And uh, he was a very persuasive advocate as well. And it was really um, his advocacy, I think, which persuaded the judge in the Romania trial not to sentence Mandela and the others to death, uh, which was an option. I think it was a his tactics. There. And the way he he worked uh, saved Mandela and the others from what the prosecutor uh, confidently predicted would be a death penalty. Professor Hippel, you had to escape from South Africa yeah. around this time. Um, was this something that was? Do you, can you describe how this? Yeah. Went? Well, I was uh, I was released. Uh, I was uh, first of all. I must say that. While in prison and under interrogation, I made a statement to the police about what I, probably what I was doing there, and uh, they promised me that I would be released if I made this statement. But of course, they didn't release me, and instead they put me on trial with Mandela. Uh, but the very soon after I was, uh, the trial started, uh, again led by Brom Fisher, the indictment was quashed for lack of particularity, and at that point, I was released. But it was a conditional release 
because the prosecutor announced that he was going to call me as a state witness. Now there was no way in which I was going to give me a state witness against uh, these people whom I admired and respected. And so I had to find a way of getting out straight away. And um, I w at the time I was married, um, my wife Shirley had also been politically active, my then wife, and we decided um, that she could not remain. We had two very small children, aged two and well, under one years, and um, because the practice of the police was to arrest uh, the spouse of the person who tried to escape, to put pressure on them. So she and I had to leave together, and we arranged this escape route with the help of the underground ANC um, over into what was then Betuan and Protectorate. So we had to climb over a fence into Betuan, and we were hidden away for a few days, and we then reported to the British authorities um, there uh, who, who helped us and we chartered a plane with two other people who were escaping uh, and which flew us uh, to Tanzania. And um, in Tanzania we were granted political asylum. The ANC kind of welcomed us there and we got political asylum. But of course we wanted to be reunited with our children and so we very soon arranged to fly to England and there we'd left the children in the care of their grandparents and uh, they, the children were brought over to us um, about six weeks or so after we had left South Africa. It's just, as I said, something that most people can't even begin to imagine. <laughs> I hope they don't have to experience it. <laughs> um, Professor Hippel, um, coming back then to memories of figures that you knew from those early years, did you ever meet um, Robert Sabukwe? Uh, yes, he taught me. He started teaching me Zulu. He was a lecturer at the University, at Wits University, when I was a lecturer there from 1959 to 61. And I decided I wanted to learn Zulu. And he was a lecturer, and that was in 1959. And so he was uh, one of our course lecturers. Uh, and then, of course, he took part in the. He was the leader of the Pan Africanist Com Congress. And they organized the demonstrations at Sharpful, which ultimately resulted in the massacre. And then he was locked up. But so I had met him, yes, as a, as a teacher. As a teacher. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I was reading in Mandela's book that he was from Accra Renet. Yes. It seemed to be an unlikely yeah. place, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you ever meet Nelson Mandela again after you... Uh, I did meet him a few times after he, when he came to England and in particular um, the story which has now gained a lot of currency was at um, uh, the, there was a state banquet for him in Buckingham Palace and my wife and I were invited and you have to queue up uh, and the footman tells your name to the Queen who then introduces you to the guest who was the state president Mandela and he said, Professor and Mrs. Heppel, and my wife went up and uh, to the Queen. And as she was with the Queen, Mandela leant over the Queen, who's a very diminutive stature, and he's a tall man. And he said, Bob, is that you? And he stretched out with one of his great bear hugs. And it was a very emotional moment, and I just said a few words to him. We had to move on. And um, as we walked away, my wife said, you know, Her Majesty is still waiting for you with her hand <laughs> outstretched. I totally ignored the Queen. <laughs> That's a Majesty, you know. <laughs> uh, so, no, I did meet him, and then I met him with another group of other South Africans at the South African Embassy, where we had a very interesting discussion. Mm. I presumably you didn't have any contact with his wife. Um, no, uh, during the years he was in hiding, I have to say that I did uh, know Winnie, but I never yeah. met her again. Oh. So y you arrived in England yeah. and were um, given um, a, a place at Clare. Yes. And that was through your friendship with um, Mr. Colin Turpin and, uh, and Pollock. Ken Pollock, yeah. Yes. 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 We're both uh, South Africans who were lecturers at in Cambridge University, yes. And I hope to come to um, your time in England, your achievements 
after your arrival here in a later interview. Since 1994, mm. Professor Hippel, have you played um, any sort of role in South African law or politics? Yes, uh, uh, first of all, uh, during the 1980s when I was um, teaching at University College London, I found a number of South African students were coming to do the postgraduate master's LLM course uh, and attending my courses on international comparative labour law. And I realised there was a totally new generation of lawyers coming up in South Africa who were very engaged in subjects like labour law, human rights, administrative law. And um, really uh, through them, uh, immediately, I had, the South African government had placed me under banning orders for 27 years, which were lifted the day after Mandela was released from prison in 1990. And I immediately received an invitation to come and address a big labor law conference in Durban. And it was my first visit back. And from then on, I've kept quite close contact and I've been back to South Africa at least once a year. But the projects in which I was very much concerned, first of all, in 1990, the International Labour Organization, the ILO, um, asked me to help draft a labour code for the new independent Namibia. And I spent some time working on that with some South African lawyers. And then in 1994, uh, the South African government invited me to be on what was called a ministerial task force which was uh, drafting new labour laws for South Africa. And we did that through the ILO again. Uh, that was a very interesting experience. And then I've had various visiting professorships, both at Fitz University, I was an honorary professor in Cape Town for many years. So I've kept up links yes. in, in that way. Do, do you have any opinions of the new constitution for the long term? Well, it's probably a wonderful, it is a wonderful constitution. It's kind of a model which has been looked at in various places. And I think the South African Constitutional Court um, is a very uh, significant institution. People are citing its judgments and so on. And generally, uh, I think uh, it's, it's helped the stability of the new South Africa because it's open to all South Africans. And suddenly even those who oppose the regime have found they have freedoms they didn't have before, like freedom of speech. Uh, so I think uh, the new constitution on the whole, I can't comment in detail, but on the whole has been a good, good thing for South Africa. We come then finally to the last part of this interview, which is your piece that you wrote in 1960. I'm dealing with this now rather than with okay. scholarly work because of the time frame. Economic and Racial Legislation. Yeah written in your early years, and according to Barnard et al., the Harlow and Ellison chapter was heavily censored. In what way? I can't remember the details now, but um, they didn't want anything controversial. In other words, I, and I haven't reread it, I have to say, for a long time, but my recollection is that it was uh, had to be written in a very neutral way, just factual, what the laws were. And all my feelings were that I wanted to express uh, horror, disgust, uh, critic, criticism of them and so on. Uh, but I wasn't able to do that. And I can remember not so much Kahn, who was more interested in the, the fine print, but Harlow sitting with me with a blue pencil, crossing out anything that expressed an opinion. Um, and of course, this was one of my very first publications, and I wasn't going to argue with it. Subsequently, people uh, have said, well, you know, why weren't you more critical? But I, my defense is, um, well, as long as it's factually correct, I did what I was asked to do. There were three sections, mining law and regulation of monopolies. Those were the first two. How were these areas affected by the nationalist legislation or were they relatively neutral? I think my, uh, mining law, I mean, I think there were some racial restrictions on who could get mining licenses and so on. Mm -hmm. I wasn't an expert on mining law, and in fact, uh, I was sent by Harlow to see Brom Fisher, who uh, strangely was the country's leading expert on mining law. His practice was very much um, based on uh, doing mining cases, and so he vetted the chapter. I wrote it on the basis of the books, and he vetted it for me. Uh, on monopolies, uh, again, I think I wasn't an expert, and I had to write that. So, 
the racial legislation was the bit I knew best, <laughs> which is very much my own. So the third part of your piece was yeah. on industrial law. Yes. And obviously there has been plenty of racial legislation. Yes. Um, do you think that um, much has altered since 1994 as the centre? Oh, yes. I mean, the whole industrial law has changed completely, partly as a result of the work we did in 1994. Uh, but it had been changing for some time. I mean, for example, one of the first changes in South Africa uh, in the 1970s was when the nationalist government allowed black trade unions to be recognized. They still had to be racially segregated. And eventually the racial segregation just broke down. Um, so there had been a development over about 20 years right. uh, there, and, and it's changed completely. Well, that takes us up to the end of your time in South Africa and hopefully we can look at the next bit in the next interview. So I wish to thank you very much again for kindly agreeing to come and be interviewed. Um, very thank, you very to you. thank you very much. Thank you.